1971, Italian car maker Fiat introduced a new car to the market, the Fiat 127. Following its popularity across Europe, the Italians updated their car in 1977 and released a Series 2 model. At the same time, Fiat also worked alongside Yugoslavian car maker Zastava on a car that would be based on a shortened Fiat 128 platform, but with the stylings of the 127. After a few years of development, the final product rolled off the production lines in 1980, and that product was to be known as the Yugo. Now, in addition to offering your customers the greatest value in America, you can offer them exciting new styling and design with the Yugo GVL and GVX models, all a part of the GV series. The Yugo GV is a remarkably equipped hatchback that gives new meaning to the term basic transportation. Let's take a look at why. Although this particular model of car is still quite common over in the former Yugoslavian states, this one is probably one of the most unique of them all. You see, in the 1980s, a businessman from the U.S. got the rights to sell them in the U.S., and between 1985 and 1991, there was about 140,000 sold, even making a couple of appearances in Hollywood movies. The only car the department was willing to release to us at this point was an unmarked 1987 Yugo. A Yugoslavian import. So this particular Yugo is actually quite unique. See, this is basically a U.S. market California drivetrain, but in a right-hand drive shell. And this particular car was commissioned and designed specifically to be a prototype for the Australian market. But due to the fall of the Yugoslavian government and in addition of sanctions, Zastava never brought Yugo over. So this is one of one. There is none other like it in the world as far as we know, and it took about 20 years for Daniel to find it. So this car was built by request um, by an importer from Melbourne, um, a company called MW Motors that doesn't exist anymore. They um, commissioned um, this car from Zastava. Um, it was built to ADR standards for that particular year. The car came here in 87 and that was it. It, it never, the, in, the, the export project to Australia never began. Many years later, in, in mid 90s, the car was sold um, via an ad in the age. The first time I saw the car was probably around 99, 2000. I saw it on the Eastern Freeway and it was literally like, follow that car. I was beside myself when I saw it because I, I, I knew they don't exist in Australia. I knew that I'm not going to see one here or I wasn't expecting to see one. And when, 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 when I saw one, it was like, wow. So we followed him and when the, when the gentleman stopped, um, I, I asked to look at the car and introduce myself. I, I remember I wasn't driving, so I didn't have my learners yet. So I must have been 15. Um, and um, I asked him immediately if he would sell it and he said no. So the, 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 the mission um, then sort of began and, and, and lasted many years. I negotiated back and forth with the, with, with the owner. He wanted to sell me the car at, at one particular point. Um, we couldn't um, come to complete terms on, on pricing and everything. Um, and then he also changed his mind about selling it. Subsequently, in the meantime, the car suffered um, some damage in a, in a front um, side collision um, that the previous owner was involved in. Uh, thankfully, everyone was okay, uh, except the car. The car suffered. And then basically was off the road from early 2002 um, until 2017. The last time I saw the car was in 2004. Um, and after that, I didn't see it until November 17. Uh, in that time frame, the car sat in the same spot. Uh, it did not move, it was not started, it was not um, looked at, basically. Um, all the years that I spent in Europe, um, I would, because I, because I knew um, where the car was. When Google Maps um, um, was available in Street View, I would, I would go um, on Street View to see you know, whether the car is there, and I'd be like, yep, it's still there, underneath the covers. So between 2005 and 2017, I was, I was in Europe, I was in Serbia. And, um, 
and yeah, so I was basically monitoring the car status um, from there. We landed here on the 6th of November. On the 8th of November, I was in my parents' car on the way to Box Hill to see him. Um, so don't look for a job. Um, don't try and find a rental property. You know, the mission was the Yugo. So I went there, um, we unboxed the car because it was covered with a black tarpaulin uh, um, like cover. It was there with um, deflated tires and basically, you know, let's say neglected, yeah? And I said to him, you know, I want it, let's, you know, talk price. But he made me go, go away to think about how much money I need to spend to get the car back on the road and then think about what price I'm going to offer him. So he put a bit of fuel in it and water in the uh, radiator and uh, put a battery in it and we started cranking it and um, it started and it ran fine. Um, so I knew that the only thing that I need to do to it was the, um, to, to fix the, the collision damage that was there in the front right corner. And um, apart from that, you know, do a service on it and everything else would be fine because the car had 17 and a half thousand miles on the clock, original miles. So this is the only um, Yugo Australia prototype and it's the only one of that kind in existence. So if you've heard the name Yugo before, you may have heard it on a particular TV show who blew one up or from journalists saying that it was the worst car ever. I mean, they were notoriously known for being problem ridden, full of issues and seeing that they're fairly utilitarian and based on an old Fiat design, they're not exactly known for being luxurious. But does a car of this age actually deserve that sort of criticism? You see, this car is quite utilitarian. It's, yes, it's based on an old Italian platform, but it's actually quite endearing. I like the sound it has. I like the sound the engine makes. It's a very particular sound, a very characteristic Fiat um, um, engine sound. That engine was developed in the late 60s for the use in the Fiat 128. So we're obviously talking about 1960s technology um, in a package that was built in 1980s. To me, the car handles nice. Um, I've had different versions of the car, more sportier versions where the tires are wider, where it's more about the performance driving. This car is all about enjoying the drive and enjoying the nostalgia. So when I'm feeling nostalgic or I want to feel like I'm, I'm back in my other home, um, I, I get in the Yugo, I take it for a drive. So let's take this for a spin. Oh, I love cable throttle. Right. What's this little Yugo like? Well, <laughs> it's so simple. Getting the same thing into reverse is actually quite interesting. That was not it. Yeah, that's it, that's it. All right, yeah, here we go. So first off, you have no power steering, which I'm actually really okay with. This car only weighs less than 800 kilos, I think it's like 790. And you don't really need power steering that much, do you? Do you really need it? I mean, it doesn't make it easy to park, but it gives you a lot of feedback. And it's simple, effective, and quite frankly, incredibly endearing. I mean, these cars were designed to be utilitarian transport. They weren't designed to be fast. They weren't designed to be luxurious. They're designed to get people A to B as often as possible and as reliably as possible. And for a car whose idea was not to be engaging, it feels pretty engaging, particularly in the format of a modern, or against a modern car. Now, I can't really compare it against any of its rivals from that era, mainly because my reference points are Pontiacs and Porsches in that era, so probably not a great, a great pick. But I can say that the lack of uh, electronic fuel injection and electronic throttle control is not a problem. Not at all. Not even slightly. It's, it's got decent pep. I mean, it's not, again, not designed to be super fast, but 45 kilowatts, 
and unit units of torque, four speed, fairly close gears actually. It doesn't, it's not overly long gearing. But this engine, being an old Fiat engine essentially, is not working that hard. It's doing perfectly fine. We're doing uh, roughly about 70 Ks at the moment, so 45, 50 miles an hour, and it's not trying. And the little tinny noise it makes, fantastic. <laughs> little cars like this will put a smile on your face. <laughs> Just because they exist. <laughs> this feels great in the hands. It, it doesn't feel... It's not supposed to feel sporty or lively. It, it, it doesn't feel uh, agricultural either which is kind of what I expected, to be honest. <laughs> no electronics in the car beyond just some famous, some basic interior bits like demisters and an interior fan, uh, and of course your indicators and whatnot. And it helps if I find the right gear. There we go. I mean, there's only four. I, can, I have a 25% chance of getting it right. <laughs> I got it. Oh, by the way, I still haven't figured out how to hill toe in this thing yet. <laughs> <laughs> the pedals are just in such the weirdest place. As a like ex-pro dancer, this should not be that hard, but <laughs> it is. <laughs> Let's see if I can do it here. There we go. A little bit of a dent. <laughs> I'm too tall for this car, I reckon. <laughs> so many things to think about in old cars that you don't necessarily think about in your day-to-day -day driving. I definitely miss. And it, when I say old, this car was essentially built in 1987 um, as a prototype, or 86-ish, there's a bit of a, a debate there. Um, but it only has 20,000 miles on it, so over just over 30,000 kilometers. And it drives as if it was brand new. Doesn't miss a beat, does all the things, nothing's broken, nothing's out of place. Mint. Every time I take it out for a drive, there's people that beep at me or they wave or... It's the only car that I've ever driven that get so many smiles from different people and and it's and it, it um, I, I know why is because it reminds them of of something of either the car that they had or a life that they had or um, a good memory I guess um, thankfully it brings more positive memories than bad ones um, I'm, I'm sure there were plenty of those as well um, considering what the country went through but um, let's try and and, and forget those and, and move on from there but the nice memories are the ones that that, that that stay and it's what this car triggers when when people see it especially not expecting to see it i've had people pull me over the side of the road like literally overtake me and flag me down to stop whether i like it or not <laughs> uh, because they want to take a photo of it or they want to see it or they want to you know touch and feel it um, uh, um, there was a gentleman at a petrol station that literally i was just about to take off and he got in front of the car and stopped me and started crying because and then when i got out and i started talking to him he worked at the factory he 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 he, he built them um so he couldn't believe that that he's seeing one here after so many years so it's um the 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 positive emotion that it that this car triggers with 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 the people that that, that see it here is worth a lot more than $39.90 how much it costs brand new in, 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 in the States, for example. So you guys overseas were actually sold with several different engines depending on the variation in trim level. This particular one's a bit unique. This particular car has an 1100cc four-cylinder overhead cam engine, eight valves, twin barrel carburetors, and it would have been with the USGV spec emission systems on it as well, producing about 45 kilowatts, 80 newton meters of torque, all through a four-speed gearbox, and it only weighs about 790 kilos. So it's got a pretty decent power to weight ratio. 
So by comparison, this car actually had the same power to weight ratio as a mid 80s Holden Barina and the Suzuki Swift. And if you were in the right country, parts were pretty cheap and readily available. Uh, when I was um, there two years ago, I needed the rear, uh, the rear muffler because the original one was, um, let's say, on its way out. It's a $10 part, it doesn't cost much. So I bought one and, um, and I put it in the suitcase. So when I came to check in, um, they asked me, have you got any dangerous goods, etc. I said, I haven't got anything dangerous, but I got a muffler. So the lady at the, um, at the SAB counter looked at me, she said, you got what? I said, I've got a muffler for a Yugo 55. And she smiled and she said, are you taking that with you? I'm like, yes. I have to send this to the scanning machine. I'm like, that's fine. So we went to the scanning machine. She puts it in there and the, and the, and the operator, an older gentleman, is looking at the camera and he goes, yep, that's a Yugo 55 muffler. I had one of those. It can go through. Growing up around them, we, we, we had one in the family, so probably a little bit of nostalgia. Um, it was something that, that reminded me of um, my childhood back in Yugoslavia. And um, for me, um, it was, and obviously it's a, it's a childhood that, that is related to a country that no longer exists. Um, for me, it was I had a good child. I had a nice childhood, and my memories um, and my family's memories of time in that country were good. Different people have different associations to that former country, but you know, my association was good. And the rem the reminder that that car had uh, for me was always a positive one. And um, basically, growing up around that, everyone had one. Uh, we had one. Uh, cousins had one. Neighbors had one. Um, it was the car that um, you usually would learn to drive in, that you would go to your high school prom in, that you would, you know, go to a wedding in. It was, you know, the car for all occasions. And, um, and basically a lot of um, my life prior to Australia is tied around with it. So yes, the 55A is one of the most unique cars in Australia, particularly being one of one globally. And I've had quite a pleasure with it today. And, yeah, you can buy your Porsches, your McLarens, your Ferraris, your Lamborghinis, whatever, and whatever special spec and one-on-one as you want. But you'll never be able to buy what this little car stands for. People that are into cars in general, people dream of cars that cost, you know, six-figure sums and um, that have eight or 10 or 12 cylinders. My dream was a 55 horsepower car that um, I knew that I couldn't have and then I could, so yeah, basically, you know, my dream came true.